welcome to this week's edition of Northwest Newsweek. I'm Riley McManus. A historic decision has been made in Ignace. The township declared itself willing to host a nuclear waste repository. Council passed the resolution following the results of a survey, which showed 77% of residents want Ignace to stay in the running as the permanent home for Canada's used high-level nuclear fuel. Justin Hardy was present for the decision and brings us the details. Thank you once again, everyone. Ignace is now the first community to declare itself willing to continue in the selection process as a potential site of the Nuclear Waste Management Organization's Deep Geological Repository. The proposed repository is one of the first of its kind in the world. The decision was made by a unanimous vote of town council during a special meeting on Wednesday. Before the vote, the Willingness Ad Hoc Committee presented the findings of a public survey. According to the report, a majority of those that participated in interviews supported the project. From the voting results, 640 of the 1,035 eligible voters took part. 77.3% voted yes and 1.9% abstained. That still leaves roughly a fifth of those participating, indicating that they are not willing. Ignace Mayor Kim Bagri says that the municipality will continue to keep an open dialogue with residents. The door will always be open at the Learn More Centre here in the, in the community. Anyone who wants to learn more can actually go there. And we will encourage anyone that wants information to go there. So they will, they will always have the opportunity to learn. Also, critical voices are going to be instrumental in the process moving forward, ensuring safety and accountability and transparency. There's always room for critical voices in the process. This decision keeps Ignace in the running for the final choice for the Nuclear Waste Repository. The other potential site, South Bruce, along with its First Nation neighbor, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, still need to decide if they are, in fact, willing to host the DGR. This gives Ignace time to improve its infrastructure and make itself more appealing for the project and for those that live there. I think it is appealing, <laughs> first and foremost. It's where I choose to live, work, and play. Um, do we need to invest in our community? We would, regardless of NWMO coming. Um, our community is worthy of investment, and we'll always look forward to those opportunities. In order for the NWMO to choose the IGNE site, Wabagoon Lake also needs to decide whether or not it is willing. There is currently no set public date on when it will make this decision. Justin Hardy, TBT News. Although support for the Nuclear Waste Repository is strong among Ignace residents, outside the township there is a lot of opposition. Activists with We the Nuclear Free North are questioning the integrity of the willingness process and arguing more people should have had a say. No Stop. dumping! Stop. Save Stop. the water Stop. lab! Stop. The organization believes the decision should have been a regional, if not provincial one. They don't support burying nuclear waste anywhere and say all communities along the transportation route for the used fuel bundles should have had an equal say. We, the Nuclear Free North spokesperson Wendy O'Connor, says she was disappointed but not surprised by the decision. She believes the whole process was designed to create rather than measure willingness in economically vulnerable communities. O'Connor takes particular issue with the way Ignace Council opted to consult its residents. South Bruce, for instance, is having an actual re referendum on this in October, and I believe the question that residents will be asked is a more direct question of whether they favour the presence of a nuclear waste facility near their community. Whereas Ignace uh, residents were asked an oblique question. They were asked whether they um, were in favour of their municipality continuing in the siting process with the NWMO. I'm not sure if all citizens realize that that is the final question. That is the question that informed council to say yes uh, to the repository. Although the decision is a blow to the anti-nuclear activists, O'Connor says they'll continue to fight and they're organizing visits to other municipalities. They also hope to meet with provincial and federal representatives to share their perspective. The Transportation Safety Board says it's unclear why the pilots lost control in a fatal northwestern Ontario plane crash that killed two people in early 2023. The TSB released its findings earlier this week. The Cessna 208B caravan belonging to Thunder Bay's based Wilderness North Air left the Makina Airport on February 28th with groceries and other household items bound for Abitung First Nation. But the plane crashed about a third of the way there, near Shawshire Lake, killing two pilots on board, 
who are both from the Thunder Bay area. The TSB says there's insufficient information to determine exactly why the pilots lost control. There's no indication that their performance was hindered by fatigue or medical factors, and aircraft records show no outstanding defects. The plane wasn't found until March 4th of 2023, four days after the crash. The TSB notes there was no emergency locator transmitter on board as it had been removed for recertification. The provincial government is being taken to court by a Northwestern Ontario First Nations. Grassy Narrows filed a lawsuit in Ontario Superior Court of Justice Friday, challenging the validity of the Mining Act. Justin Hardy reports. Asab Squishiwagong Neta Manishna Beck, also known as Grassy Narrows, says that the province's Mining Act violates its constitutional rights. The First Nation is asking the court to declare that the province has a duty to consult and obtain its informed consent before registering or renewing mining claims in its territory, and that the government has breached those duties. It is also asking the court to order a halt of all current and planned mining projects in the area until proper consultation takes place and consent is given. You know, we will continue to protect our land and, and we will never stop. And so um, free prior and informed consent needs to take place place accordingly and do and that means the government should talk to us before they do something not inform us after the fact and right now we're being informed after the fact after uh, permits have been given should grassy narrow succeed in its lawsuit it could force the province to rescind thousands of existing mining claims the first nation says have been staked in its territories without consultation or consent Grassy Narrows adds that it could set a precedent that would affect mining projects throughout the province. That That is indeed what is being sought through this application, is uh, a declaration about the, the invalidity, the constitutional invalidity of the Mining Act, and the what flows from that is that the mining claims authorized through that regime are unlawful, and that is... If we're successful, that's something that Ontario is going to have to address uh, and should address that with Grassy Narrows. Grassy Narrows also appealed to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights this week over mercury contamination in a river system that flows through its territory. Justin Hardy, TBT News. One person died in an ATV collision in Marathon on Monday morning. According to the OPP, it happened on Highway 627 just before 9 o'clock. The single vehicle crash closed the highway for roughly eight hours. OPP haven't released any information about the victim. They continue to investigate the incident. Meanwhile, another driver died after hitting a moose on Highway 105 around 5.45 a.m. in the Red Lake area. The victim was sent to hospital before succumbing to their injuries. OPP also continue to investigate that incident. The highway has now reopened. Atacokan residents are finally able to breathe a sigh of relief now that they know the local OPG station's energy contract will be extended. That revelation, along with another major energy project coming to the region, are creating a positive outlook for the community. Justin Hardy has more. The town of Atacokan is excited to have an answer on whether or not the contract for the Ontario Power Generation Station near the municipality will be extended. The biomass power plant represents over one-third of the town's tax base, and the producer of the pellets used in the station is also situated in Atacokan. Mayor Rob Ferguson, who retired from his longtime career at OPG in January, says they have received word from the province that the contract will be extended. They haven't put pen to paper and uh, sealed the deal yet, but they have made an announcement that it's going to be five years, and it's going to be very similar to what the contract looked like for the original 10. So it's great for the town of Atacokan, but as I said before, once the deal is signed for five years, then we start working on the next one for sure. The OPG station is a major source of employment for the municipality, and while the contract isn't 10 years like the town wanted, it still brings many Atacokan residents a sigh of relief. We can talk about it, and then it's going to go forward, but until it's actually announced and the deal's done, then there's always people that aren't going to that aren't going to believe it till it's done. So it's uh, it's a relief for the town of Atacokan, or it's, I imagine it's a relief for the people that work at the uh, at the generating station and uh, it's just good for the town. Another power project will soon be boosting the town as well. The $1.2 billion Wasigan transmission line project is getting close to beginning construction. Ferguson hopes that Atacokan's central position along the power line will make the town a hub for energy along with construction activity. It's a three or four year project from start to finish and it's going to be a good boom for the town of Atacokan and people we've got a project going on 
at the Mackenzie station right now moving a transformer that's going to supply the town of Atacoke and people are excited about that. That's only a sliver of what the actual Wasigan line is going to bring to the town. So it's very exciting for the town. Ferguson says that Hydro One is a great tenant for the town and he's looking forward to further opportunities that could arise from the project. Justin Hardy, TBT News. Four teens are facing assault charges in Edmonton First Nation. The accused are aged 13, 14, 15, and 17. According to the Nishnabi Aski Police Service, the incident occurred on Monday. A group of suspects allegedly tried to stab an adult in another youth. The 14 and 17-year-olds are facing robbery charges as well, stemming from a separate incident on Saturday, where police say a suspect produced a knife and demanded the victim's belongings. All four names are being withheld in accordance with the Youth Criminal Justice Act. Up next, we'll have an update on how small and rural LCBOs and LCBO convenient outlets are weathering the public's institution's first ever strike. The first weekend of the LCBO strike led to strong sales for rural LCBO convenient outlets. As the strike continues, they're anticipating this weekend will be just as busy. Lee Noonan has the story. The liquor shelves were looking pretty bare at Wildwood Variety following the first weekend of a historic LCBO strike. Wildwood is one of about 30 LCBO convenience outlets in northwestern Ontario. Owner Jenna Curtis says sales were double what she'd expect to see over a normal summer weekend. Uh, this weekend's been a little bit crazy. As you can see behind me, we're pretty empty, uh, but welcome to, welcome to an LCBO strike. <laughs> Curtis's stocks of wine and some liqueurs are still pretty good, but beer and coolers were flying off the shelves and spirits like vodka and gin were hit hard. Still, she wants to reassure shoppers there's more coming. They've doubled their order for this week. Everyone's kind of going into panic mode that they need to stock up. We're trying to tell everybody and express to everybody we are still getting our deliveries. We're getting deliveries on Wednesdays. Every week now we might not get as much selection. However, the LCBO is guaranteeing that we will be getting our basic selections. The rural convenience outlets aren't the only places that alcoholic beverages are still for sale. The province has now published a map of all the alcohol retailers still operating across the province and the LCBO says their home delivery service is still up and running. With so many alternatives available, local union mobilizer Mo Marcinette says they do have some concern the strike won't create the public pressure they need. 
you got to support us, you know, don't don't go shopping um, at convenience outlets. And the thing is, we don't want to target small business either. That's not what this is about. But at the same time, if others are going to exploit our misfortune, you know, we're not going to let that stand either. So people need to support us because it's good for everyone. The picketers were out all weekend in front of the Thunder Centre LCBO and they're now expanding to at least one other location in the city. Marcinet suggests to anyone who wants to support the strike that they don't buy alcohol at all, with the possible exception of buying direct from local breweries. While I support their cause, I do understand it. Um, I'm also... This is my business, right? So this is, this is my moneymaker. This is my livelihood. This is what puts plates on my children's tables as well. Lee Noonan, TBT News. Smaller towns across the Northwest have been feeling the effects of the LCBO strike at least as much as in the cities. As the province-wide strike continues, rural workers remain just as steadfast as their urban counterparts. The LCBO in Ignace has only three employees, but that doesn't stop them from standing with the workers across the province. Despite the ongoing picketing in the summer heat, spirits are remaining high, according to the workers at the Ignace location. They attribute that to the overwhelming support from the community. Corey Potts, Ignace LCBO manager, says that even though they don't have the same numbers as urban stores, they still feel it's important to stand strong. It's obviously like a union-wide effort um, and we all have to be uh, unified. So in northwestern Ontario, we're much more spread out. Um, obviously, it's just a challenge for us with the smaller stores, some of us only having three or sometimes less employees. Um, but I think it's important that everybody gets out there, uh, supports the province and shows Doug Ford that we're serious and uh, we need to make a deal that includes protections for our jobs. Potts adds that he feels it's important to keep the $2.5 billion generated annually from the LCBO public for use in services that require them. The federal government announced a big change to the Canadian dental care plan this week. It allows all dentists and hygienists to provide care under the plan without needing to sign up. As of Monday, oral health providers can treat patients participating in the program on a claim-by-claim -claim basis and bill Sun Life directly. Once a claim has been approved, providers will receive reimbursement from Sun Life within 48 hours initially and 24 hours in the near future. Thunder Bay Superior North MP Patty Haidu says this is good news for uninsured and middle-income individuals. The more dentists that offer the program, actually the better it is for Canadians because Canadians, as you know, uh, there are a number of people that don't have coverage either through their own personal benefits or uh, public benefits uh, or for one reason or another don't have coverage under any plan and it prevents people from accessing the dentist, which then uh, prevents uh, full oral health care. The plan covers a wide range of oral health care services with the amount paid for by the federal program adjusted to family income. Thunder Bay Rainy River MP Marcus Pulowski wants to see a publicly owned bridge between Fort Francis and International Falls. He's calling for the two countries to work together to replace or repair the existing bridge. The bridge is more than a century old. It has always been privately owned but changed hands after the closing of the mill and the new ownership group increased the toll, prompting calls from the community for the government to purchase the bridge. Pulowski says he's not sure whether it would make more sense to purchase and repair the bridge or build a new one, but he's firm that either way, it should be publicly owned. So it's really unfair for people in Fort Francis area that they have to pay to go across the bridge, um, whereas people in Thunder Bay or Rainy River don't have to pay across the bridge. We all pay the same tax money. It's not like they get a tax break um, in lieu of the fact that they have to pay for this bridge. So. Definitely the government ought to own the bridge. Klauski met recently with the American ambassador to Canada and the bridge was at the top of his agenda. He also proposed cross-border collaboration on a flood risk assessment for the Rainy River Basin and on addressing fishery regulations. A young singer from a small northwestern Ontario town is making his mark on the big stage as a contestant on America's Got Talent. We've got that story for you after the break.
A Northwestern Ontario singer is moving on to the next round of America's Got Talent. Atacokin's Alex Sampson wowed the judges Tuesday night with his performance of his original song, Pretty Baby. Pretty baby, Sunday maybe, we look up at the stars. Four judges praised Samson's performance. The 20-year-old's voice was compared to musicians from the 50s and 60s, including Herman's Hermits. Samson now moves on to the live performance rounds, beginning on August 13th. While one major road project is coming to an end in Atacokan, another is just beginning. Residents can expect to see detour signs around the town as road construction ramps up in the municipality. Justin Hardy reports. Traffic will once again be able to make full use of Mercury Avenue in Atacokan as the work on the culvert comes to an end, though another project means the closure of another road for the foreseeable future. The town of Atacokan declared a state of emergency last May after a storm caused the culvert's failure and washed out a 15-meter section of roadway. Now work is wrapping up, according to Mayor Rob Ferguson. He says people will enjoy having the road back. I think it's, it's, it'll be a relief. Uh, people have gotten used to going different routes, but it is a main route and people that have been here for a long time are missing that and it's going to be a welcome addition and it's going to look beautiful when it's done. The end to work on Mercury Avenue doesn't mean an end to detours around town. Atacokan has started a project that will see work being done on over four kilometers of O'Brien Street. That's a big project. That's been in the works for quite a few years. Uh, it's uh, just about an eight million dollar project, which is huge for, the, for a town of 3,000 people. So we're replacing water lines and repaving so it's going to be a, a project it's about four and a half kilometers of road uh, you could see that uh, a lot of work's going on in the downtown area the work has already started at the intersection of o'brien and main street with the entire road and much of the sidewalk dug up though there is still some pedestrian access to businesses work is expected to last all summer and final repaving of both the o'brien street project and the mercury avenue culvert project is planned to take place this fall justin hardy tbt news Health providers gathered in Thunder Bay this week to better understand the unique care needs of Indigenous people. The Registers Nurses Association of Ontario held a three-day conference, the first of its kind. The conference brought together healthcare professionals working with Indigenous communities all around Northern Ontario. The RNAO's Indigenous Best Practice Spotlight Organizations. The theme of the event was Weaving Indigenous Ways of Knowing. The goal is to help service providers learn from each other and provide the best possible outcomes for patients through evidence-informed and culturally appropriate practices. CEO Doris Greenspoon founded the program and explains its importance. ensure that the program responds to the needs of indigenous communities and that is not imposing a different ways of knowing uh, that don't fit the indigenous communities. And also it's important because we are learning and, and that's what inspires me. Working together with our NEO and to work together as a team to support each other and to learn from each other. And that way we can move forward improve health care. Until this week, the various organizations had only been able to meet virtually. A local group is working to qualify the health care challenges faced by First Nations people in the region. Mamo Ayamoan is a health data alliance of 77 First Nations across northern Ontario. Their first report released in 2020 showed that people are dying much younger in the communities they studied than the province at large. 61% died before the age of 65, compared to the provincial average of 22%. It was also found that the rate of premature deaths had doubled since 1992. They met with community members and service providers this week in Thunder Bay to talk about the preliminary data for their current study on chronic conditions. Some of the questions that we're asking folks who are here today looking at the data are things like, does this data make sense to you? Um, what might be causing the increase in the condition that we're looking at here? Um, does your community have good access to services that would be needed to manage this condition and stuff like that?
If all goes well, the report could be presented to participating First Nations by the end of the year and to the public sometime after that. They're also conducting an analysis on mental health and addictions, and there's an analysis on injuries coming up after that. All three reports were prompted by questions raised in the original mortality study. And that wraps up this week's edition of Northwest Newsweek. We hope to see you again next week. Thank you.